Good morning, all, and welcome to uh, uh, Heart Center Grand Rounds. It is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce to you uh, an old friend and colleague, Dr. Rafael Espada. Most of you in this room um, uh, know him, or many of you do anyway, and it is, uh, it is a great honor to have him come back and speak to us today. Uh, Rafael uh, finished his medical school training in Guatemala in 1969. Um, and came to the United States right after that, where he was um, uh, accepted into the general surgery program here uh, at Baylor under Dr. DeBakey, um, and he completed his cardiothoracic training here as well, and in 1974 joined Dr. Jimmy Howell, and um, really uh, continued in practice as a cardiothoracic surgeon over here until 2006, when he left uh, to go back to Guatemala um, um, and uh, um, ultimately ran for office and was vice president of Guatemala from 2008 to 2012. Right after that, um, he became dean of the medical school, uh, which he uh, continues to be, um, and uh, he has a very busy practice of cardiothoracic surgery at a, uh, at a, at a large, the largest hospital uh, in town and also serves as Dean of Health Sciences. So his day typically starts at five in the morning. He operates in the morning and then he goes to the medical school in the afternoon where he spends time doing all of the academic duties that, uh, 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 that he needs to, comes back and makes rounds on his patients and repeats it the next day. So it's an exhausting life which mimics the life that he used to have over here. My interaction with Raphael really uh, started in 1988 when I first came here from England. Um, and uh, really, I spent years training with him and owe much of what I know uh, to, to him. He is an extremely accomplished, uh, technically gifted uh, cardiothoracic surgeon, very well published, and um, uh, has done extraordinary work in Guatemala uh, <laughs> to help uh, underprivileged people, which he was doing uh, really uh, back in the, uh, in the, starting in the 70s and was very actively involved through all the period that I was here and continues to do that. So he's a man of many facets and uh, he's going to speak to us today about the, uh, about the evolution of, uh, of thoracic surgery and medicine and other healthcare um, uh, aspects uh, in Central America, Guatemala. Rafael. Good morning, it's a pleasure to be here with you I feel at home. This was my home most of my life I spent in this institution. And I'm glad to see all these new installations and new things that you have because it's fantastic. Houston is growing amazingly. And this center goes every day for something new. I've seen cranes since I came in 69. They have cranes in the medical center. Still I see the cranes and the building and the building. It's amazing to see uh, all the growth and positive functions of this uh, great medical center that I was so lucky to be at. And I'm glad to see some good friends and good faces. Dr. Bill Winters is here. I'm very glad to see him. He's, he was one of my mentors, one of my teachers. I remember when I was in Panama ICU for six months, locked up 24 hours a day. He used to come every morning and they told me I was crazy because I was laughing every morning. I think I was crazy, but that made you crazy to be there. But I learned a lot, and I tell you, this center uh, teaches you a lot. I've been very lucky in life to be uh, able to come and, and to come to this to this institution. Let me start with this nice picture. That was in the eighties, right when when my age was coming. Uh, it was it was good to see all this. I was looking at all my old pictures. I wanted to bring all the pictures I have from the medical center, but it will take a whole day to show you all the pictures. Mike was there, he was, he was, they all these people was, they would work with, without me, and they were my residents, they were my partners, they are my friends. Last night I was with them, and uh, we had a couple of drinks together and a nice dinner, and it was, it was fun to be with everybody. Uh, John Apples is here, he was the chief of anesthesia. He, he joined us, I saw him coming fresh, without gray hair, just like all of us, without gray hair at all. You can see me here without gray hair at all. But this is the whole team that we used to work with, Dr. George Morris, and one of the greatest vascular surgeons here in town, Dr. Jack Rome, that started the, radio, the modern radiology in this institution. Because before Jack Rome, we did used to do all the x-rays. 
we used to do arteriograms, and, and we spent half of the day doing the other grams. Dr. Jimmy Howell was here, one of the greatest surgeons uh, in this nation. Technically, he was an excellent surgeon, great teacher, hardworking guy. Uh, he passed away last year, but he was one of the greatest surgeons I've seen in the operating room. Dr. George Noon uh, with sideburns and, and, and no gray hair at all. I'm, I'm, I'm sure he'll be here in a little bit. Dr. Wiesnan, Jim Garza is here. He was, I think he was just coming as a resident. Uh, Gerald Lowry, he told me he was going to come here today, so well, probably he's in the operating room right now. But there's a lot of people that I have great memories, and, and like this, every year was new people, new people. And uh, uh, this is a great institution, so uh, I'm very glad to be here. Uh, like I said, I feel like I'm home, and let me sort of uh, try to run, because there's a lot of stories to tell you. Uh, in the experiences that I have first, uh, uh, in here in this medical center, uh, this is a picture in the uh, 90s of the medical center. Uh, the method was here with the founding building. Uh, the, the, the towers uh, over San Luis were just being built. The syringes, those big syringes were built, built up at this time. And uh, all this area, and it was just a, a nice green part. I can see all the buildings and everything growing. I'm glad that Baylor is still there. It's a nice, old, but beautiful building that we all love uh, to see. And the growth has been just tremendous to see. And this is not that far. At that time, we thought that this was it. It was the greatest medical center in the world and couldn't grow anymore, but still growing. I'm sure it's going to be growing. This is was a nice picture that we took with Dr. Reiki. These are all the Guatemalan doctors that were at Baylor, working with Baylor. Dr. Neri Flores was around here, but uh, Dr. Flores is here. Uh, these are two pediatricians, Dr. Stein and Dr. Cabrera. Dr. Munoz, Dr. Muñiz, he's in Amarillo right now. Dr. Juan Olivero, a nephrologist. And this Dr. Estrada was a pathologist. So uh, this was the Guatemalan team that was at Baylor at that time. And uh, we were very honored to be with Dr. Reiki. And he was always very special with us. And in 2006, I decided to go back to Guatemala. First, I wanted to be working in Guatemala. I wanted to do heart surgery in Guatemala. My dream when I was finishing here was to go to Guatemala. I remember very well when I finished my training in 76, Dr. Reiki just came from Guatemala to give some talks. And he asked me, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm going to go to Guatemala to do heart surgery. He said, you're crazy. Guatemala, there was nothing. I mean, there was really nothing. He said, you're going to be wasting your time in the training an astronaut and go and ride bicycles in Guatemala. So with a good vision like he always had, he said, you better stay here, uh, mature here, we don't learn. You just finished your residency, you don't know anything. But he used to tell us, you don't know anything, you have to work 20 more years to be really a good surgeon. So stay here, train well, and then go to Guatemala and do your thing. And that's what I did. I stayed here for 38 years. Uh, during that time, I went to Guatemala once a month. I used to go there and do some surgeries. Uh, Mr. Nunez helped me a lot to set up all that program in Guatemala. And then in 2006, I was going to do heart surgery and go there. And then I'll tell you the story of what happened that I ended up in politics. It was, was a different thing that I had training to. Because really, there's no school for vice presidents or presidents. If not, we have better politicians. But you just go there, jump in the, like a parachute, jump and, and see what happened. But it's a great experience. I'll be talking to you a little bit. But it was my ICU team. This is the ICU uh, the day shift. In, in ICU, I couldn't take the three shifts, but uh, I didn't have all this picture, but these are great people, which I learned a lot from. I tell you, these nurses and these, these, these technicians were great. 90% uh, of the things I know is because of them, mainly in ICU, they were great. And this is my OR team. Um, these are the, the, all our great pump techs. Actually, they were here, but they had to go back because they had an emergency in the cardiac cath lab. These are the pump techs and all these were the nurses they told me that she's just retiring right now. So this is a bunch of great people that uh, I love and I remember all my life because they were part of my life. And this is a, a great team. Mike in there, we were uh, the, the trio that were running the medical staff in 2005, six, and seven. Uh, Robert Jackson, Mike Jordan, and myself, it was in my office. Uh, we had a great, we had a great time. 
looking at all the administration, fighting with the administrators and, and doing things. And it was great. It was great. It was, it was a great position to be at. Actually, remember, when I came as a staff, Dr. Winters was the president of the medical staff. And he was there several times. Uh, due to this organization, this combination between physicians and administration, this center is what it is. Because there's always good communication, good communion in between administrators and physicians, which sometimes they don't think alike. I always tell them we have a different, I always thought about what we think. We are trained with a lot of knowledge and we center our thoughts in one patient. The administrators think the other way around. They have one, one, one way to do things and they spend everywhere. So we have different directions to see. So it's nice to work with them because we have a double action. We look with a lot of knowledge to one thing. They have a lot of things to a, a, a different system uh, that we work with. So anyway, it's a great position to be at. And, and then I had to go to Guatemala. Now let me tell you a little bit about Guatemala. I don't know how many of you all have been in Guatemala. But uh, Guatemala, although it's a small country, is a beautiful and great country. And we're located in the world in a very strategic position. There's no other Central America in the world. If you see the map of the whole world, the, this, this little connection uh, that we have here, uh, North America and South America connected with this little tiny little bit of piece of land, which looks very small in the world, there's no other position in the world that has that geographic situation. We are with the Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic and the Caribbean here. So we have this connection, interconnection to join all the continents. That's the reason the Panama Canal is so successful. Nicaragua is trying to build a canal, which is a thing that was thought about 200 years ago. Uh, Nicaragua was a big lake. So everybody says, well, we can put the lake and connect both oceans. But has a lot of connotations with uh, geographic and ecological things where you join sweet water with salty water. So uh, that was a little more complex. So it was easy to do the Panama Canal. And we're trying in Guatemala to build up a dry canal, which is a fast train that will cross Guatemala from the Pacific to the Atlantic. It's one of the projects that we have for the next 10 years. Uh, anyway, Guatemala, I don't know how many of you all been in Guatemala. Dr. Winters, have you been in Guatemala? You've been in Guatemala? You've been in Guatemala several times. Actually, he's from Honduras, so he was very close. Joe has been there. Mike was there. Mahesh, you have to come to Guatemala. Anyway, uh, I'm very proud of being in Guatemala, and I grew up in Guatemala. Like I said, I decided at that time to be a physician. They always ask me why, I don't know. But always I've been very, very lucky to establish relationships with people that give me an opening to progress in life. And one of them was Dr. Bakey. I knew of Dr. Bakey when I was in high school. We were doing a project, and I looked at the, uh, the, 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 the magazine that was called Look. Dr. Bakey was on the front page of Look magazine. And it was interesting to read about the guy who was doing vascular surgery and plastic arteries. So I wrote him a letter. I was telling him last night, I still have the picture that he sent me. I wrote him a letter in my very super broken English, uh, and I didn't even know what I said, but he understood what I wanted. So he sent me a picture of him signed up, which I still have, a little plastic surgery, a little plastic uh, graft, and some of his papers, which I didn't understand what they were talking about, because it was papers of a vascular surgery. But it was great to see that he put it to somebody from Guatemala. Uh, probably he didn't do it, but his staff and, and, and had the, the ability to contact me, and that inspired me a lot. And then my second connection was when I was in medical school, we're a little troublemakers, politically oriented. Uh, so we're doing problems. And then the American embassy invited us to go to the United States and see how the American system worked, how Congress worked. So they invited us to go uh, and visit Washington for six months. And I was lucky enough you know, that they assigned me to Bobby Kennedy's office. That was in 1965, after President Kennedy was assassinated. And he was preparing his campaign of being a, a president. So I had a chance to work with him for six months. A, a super guy, was inspiring guy, smart, uh, had a vision of the world totally different. The world would be different if he would have been a president of this country, but that's just my, my view. But I, he, and then he asked me, what are you going to do now when you go to Guatemala? What are you going to do? I said, well, I want to be a heart surgeon. Heart surgeon. And then a heart surgeon in the 60s was just starting. I said, who are you going to be working? Who do you want to work with? 
He said, with Dr. Becky. I sent him a letter. I told him the story about the letter. He said, no, I know Mike very well because he worked with women in Medicare. Dr. Becky was involved in the design of Medicare in this country. It was attacked at that time, and now it's a great program. Uh, but anyway, he said, I called the Becky. He called the Becky and told him that I was going to come and see him. So I came to Houston to have an interview with the Becky. Of course, I came to the boardroom. There was not a big boardroom that we had. was there on the first floor. And um, he said, you're Bobby Kennedy's friend. I said, yeah, I'm a big buddy of his, yeah. So he, he told me about you. So, so he, we started talking. I said, well, when you get done in Guatemala, send me a letter. And exactly when I finished in Guatemala, I sent him a letter asking for my residency. And immediately, George Jordan called me, and they gave me the position here. That was one of the openings of my life. And I was very grateful to both of them. They gave me the opportunity to come and work in this center and meet all of you and all the people that I had a chance to. But let me go back to Guatemala. Guatemala is a beautiful country, but has, like all the countries, good things. And I never say bad things because I'm, I tend to be optimistic in life. One of the things that I always said, and recently I was in a meeting with the former uh, prime minister of Norway, and we were talking about people, if you read the paper, if you see television, you think the third world war is coming up. The whole, thing, the whole world is collapsing, and it's horrible. And we're all very pessimistic. I was looking at some things today about the campaign. I mean, the whole, the whole country has this negative view. But we have to erase that from our minds. The world is great. The world is doing superb. We have great things, great steps. Cancer is almost controlled. Uh, life is good. The expectancy of life is growing about 30 or 40 percent. Now we have people like Dr. Winters. He was telling me he's 90 years old, but he's great. He's coming here. He attends. He participates. Dr. Big was 99. Uh, and that was the, the generation before ours. I hope that we can be 110. And I hope to see Mahesh be 110, Mike be 120, and, uh, and, and be here at that age. We're really, we're doing it. We live a better life, healthier lives. Uh, nutrition and poverty is decreasing in the world. Although we have problems, we see Africa made big steps. Central America still has a lot of problems to, to accomplish, but we are doing better. Even I have a friend of mine that has a network of television in Guatemala. I said, what you need to do in your news is divide it. Bad news and good news. Half of the program said the bad things that are happening and the other half said the good things that are happening in the world. Communication, telephones. I was just look, looking at your research live in there. We're doing great things. And medicine is really growing a lot. So uh, I'm, I'm very optimistic about the world. I think we're doing great. Uh, we have bad moments that like we all have. But I think in general, the world is moving forward great. All the things that we're going to destroy ecologically and we're going to be uh, 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 use water everywhere. I mean, things happen, but the man can control things. And the bank say, if you can think about it, we'll be done. So uh, Guatemala has a lot of problems. Everybody thinks that it's just rural, but it's half rural, half urban. And that's where most of the countries are. One thing that we have a very rich uh, cultural uh, group uh, we have, uh, we're the center of the Mayan culture. Uh, the Mayan culture was the only civilization in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, 20 centuries ago, we had the Egyptians, the Indians, the Chinese, the Babylonians. The only civilization that was up with them was the Mayans here. Then for some reasons that we don't know exactly, the Mayans got destroyed. But these guys were superb. You see, in all the discoveries they had in astronomy, in mathematics, they had the calendar. They knew how to count very well, even before the other cultures. So uh, we have a great Mayan uh, background. We have 22 Mayan languages, which I don't speak, which I'm ashamed of. But it's very difficult. It's, it's a difficult language to learn because the signs and the pronunciation and the vocabulary is terribly rich. So we have Spanish and 22 Mayan languages. Now, our uh, growth is average, 3.8 is, is medium, medium low. Uh, we should be aiming for 5, 6%, which is what a country should do. But there are countries that are worse than ours. So we're in the middle, and we hope that we're going to do better uh, because there, is, there, is th there are things going on. Uh, the industry in Guatemala is great. We are the fifth sugar producer in the world. 
that tiny little bitty country was this is the fifth producer of sugar in the whole world. So uh, they designed some uh, uh, sugar cane that per inch has about triple the sugar of the rest of the sugars in the world. It's all this biomedical engineering, and we are we really produce a lot of very technically uh, advanced uh, agricultural uh, situations. So uh, the only thing that we had is that we had a very in a lot of poverty and inequity. Uh, we have a lot of money, but in a very few hands, and the rest of the country has is has a lot of poverty, and it's a structural uh, problem that we had to work with. But it's not a thing that you can change from one day to the other. It's a program that we're looking at. And being in government gave me a very good view of what the world is going to and what we need to do. The thing is that people expect very fast uh, changes, but it's almost it's impossible to do it fast. So when you're a politician and you're in there, you just have to work and hope that your projects will have a, 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 a result 10, 15 years from that reason. Politicians don't work too much on education. Because education is a 12, 20 year program. And politicians don't see, they like to do bridges and, and uh, roads and buildings, because what people see. But the, the basic thing is education, health, and projects are long term, which is difficult to sell to the public. You, you think that's the right thing to do, people don't like it because they don't see fast results. Anyway, we have a lot of poverty. 15% of the population is extremely poor. They live on their $2 a day, which is terrible. Now, we have four things that were really bad. I learned that from the first day I was in office. Uh, there were some guys that, uh, from Global Financial Integrity that told me we have four things that are really terrible that I had to work with, which is corruption, tax evasion, money laundering, and violence. And that's the whole world. And those are four things that we really had to concentrate and work with for our long-term things. And I'll show you things that we did that currently are giving good results. A lot of the laws and things that we put in are the results that we have now in Guatemala. Guatemala is going through a big social change. For the first time, we have presidents in jail, vice presidents in jail, we have judges, uh, we have a lot of people in jail because what in the past used to be an unethical thing, now is illegal. Like receiving bribes, receiving things, was bad seen, was unethical, but they made money. But in the laws, there was no jail, or legal process for receiving bribes in government. And nobody knew that. There was, that, that, that was law. When I went to the office, I found that there was no legislation uh, against people receiving uh, uh, money that didn't belong to them. So we put a lot of laws that now they're really giving results. Uh, this is Guatemala. Let me briefly go to the city of Guatemala. It's like any other city, it's a huge city. It's about three million people working here every day. Uh, one million lives in the city, and two million come uh, and work uh, from the different parts of the country. We have nice facilities, more facilities, hotels, nice structures, and uh, the nature is, is amazingly great. This is our airport. Traffic is a problem every time. But it, when, when people get very upset about traffic, I say, well, that's, I'm very glad we have traffic. If we have traffic and congestion, it's because we have cars. We have jobs. We have gasoline a little cheaper now. So people come out and work. The, wor the horrible thing is to come out of your house and nobody in the streets, nobody with a job, and people just staying at home. I'm very glad that the cities are moving. You just have to organize better. But for me, traffic is a sign of progress and uh, growth in a country. So for the people that just talk bad about the traffic, just I was saying just get up earlier and just, just go to work an hour earlier. And then you avoid all this traffic. Of course, soccer is our, uh, our great sport. And uh, we have a cup here in the States right now. We didn't apply. We lost, and we weren't able to come here. Costa Rica and Panama was the Central American countries that came. As a matter of fact, Costa Rica is playing here in, in, in Houston on Saturday. So uh, we have different buildings, construction. There's a lot of modern structure. This is the Supreme Court Palace. And uh, this is our cathedral from the 17th century. It's a beautiful building when you go to Guatemala, you have to see it. And then this is Tikal. That was one of the main capitals of the Mayan culture. This is a new one that we discovered called Mirador. Which is about 20 times larger than this. And that was the real center of the Mayan world uh, 20, 21 centuries ago. Uh, these are the uh, 
Spanish influence in our countries, the spirituality of the Mayans is still there, even in the modern areas. You have to understand, my family comes from an area where there's a lot of Mayans, and I got the chance to talk to these people. They're very spiritual. One of the things that they, which I thought was very great, is that they think that what is happening right now is written already. So they don't worry about today and tomorrow. They worry about 100 years from now. And they, everything they do is thinking 100 years from now. It's like Dr. Reiki was thinking about 100 years ahead. He wasn't thinking about tomorrow or this afternoon or tonight where I'm going to go. It's my, children, my grandchildren, what are they going to do? And I think that's one of the keys of growing in civilization. This is the mixture of uh, the colonial. Uh, and then you see the very rich. And this is a shopping center called Kayala. It's one of the elite. I mean, you have all these great uh, stores in here. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful shopping center. I mean, you can you, even parking space in there is extremely expensive. You have to be super rich uh, uh, to go in here because they have all the stores. It's a beautiful area, but very, very rich. This is Antigua, which is one of the oldest cities in Guatemala from the colonial type, which is a very nice, and this is the Agua Volcano. Uh, this, is, this destroyed Guatemala uh, about five centuries ago and four centuries ago. But uh, we're always waiting for a big eruption from that volcano, but you just hope that won't be in, in your lifetime. But we have 22 volcanoes in Guatemala, so we have uh, an area. And this is where my office used to be in government. This was my little office, just this light here. This is where my office was, and it was great to be in government. So part of the things in 2006, when I decided to leave, because they offered me to go and run into politics, and I was lucky enough to get in there. But to get there, you really had to work something totally different, which is to do campaign. Campaigning is just, it's one of the greatest things there. It's fun. You, you go there every day and you talk to people, you meet a lot of people, you see bad things, good things. You meet good people, bad people, skinny, fat, everywhere. I mean, you see, but it gives you the, an option of talking to a lot of people that listened what they were expecting and what you wanted to do. And of course, you had to do campaign and announce yourself. You get to go out and talk to people, go there and talk to different uh, it will give you a, a, a beautiful environment to go and understand what's going on in society. Then we we're lucky enough to get into, into the office. This is the inauguration day. It was the, uh, the past uh, president and vice president. This guy is, was the president of the Congress. He went to jail because he stole $80,000. So uh, <laughs> due to the laws that we have, fortunately, we're still clean. And uh, we, we, we try to do a lot of things. This is one of the moments that you had there. And then you sit in the office and say, well, okay, what am I going to do now? I hear the vice president, what am I supposed to do? And you have to do this like in here. You sit around with very smart people, sit around with people better than you in order to do good things. And that's one of the things you have to do. You have to surround always with people that are better than you. So they can influence you, they can give you nice advice. Or they, the worst enemies you have in government is people that are telling you that everything's fine. When they told me it was fine, I didn't trust them. When somebody tells me that's bad, this is a problem, those are the people that I pick. So I have people that constantly told me all the bad things I was doing. I knew they were bad, but they reinforced me that I was bad. So that was a good thing to do, and that makes you uh, uh, what you need to do. Of course, the next day I went to the hospitals again to see what was going on. I see if they were working okay, so give me the chance to visit the hospital. And then I looked at, we had to regulate what we call, we had to be more transparent. People need to know what you're doing. Uh, first of all, I had a good contact with the press. I tried to talk to people and tell them what I was doing. Uh, we, one of the things that I found is that people have secrets everywhere. So we legally formed the Free Information Act. Everything in government was totally open. You had, by law, legally to put all the information in your office salaries, working programs. The only thing that you can do is to put your health uh, situation. Uh, the health issue was, is the only secret thing that society should have. Then the rest is totally open. That was a big step. Then we found out there, were, there was no archives. There was no, no recollection of what people did in the past. So we created an archives law. We organized archives. We have to build up the story of the country. And one of the big problems that we have the big disease was the drug trafficking. We are the center of the traffic from South America to North America. Actually, we were big producers of pseudoephedrine. Pseudoephedrine was the base for crack uh, and all these substances that are cheap 
out of destroying our, our kids. And Guatemala was a big producer of, of pseudoephedrine. So the DEA agent, now currently the ambassador of the United States in Guatemala, he came and talked to my office and said, for 20 years I've been trying to stop the production of pseudoephedrine in Guatemala. So he said, what would it take to stop it? Well, you just have to write a document to say it. So in 24 hours, uh, I, my wife was an attorney and she's a specialist in, in those things. So she, built a, she, she did the, the document and in 24 hours we stopped the production of pseudoephedrine. Of course, I, that carried me a lot of enemies. They had to put me some double bodyguards and the whole thing for a whole year because all the drug trafficking people were after me, but uh, uh, it worked pretty well. So the transparency was very good. Then we made a, an observatory of public expenses, and we published it. So we knew exactly where the money was going to, and then we pre-qualified all the investments that the government did. That was never done. Unfortunately, it was a good thing to do. Now, money laundering. Money laundering is done in two ways, construction and banking. There's no other way to do money laundering. So we directed the construction. We found out there were illegal uh, documents, illegal projects uh, that, that we had to work with in, 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 in those things. The extractive industry is pretty bad, too. It's almost as bad as the pharmaceutical industry. They really do a lot of manipulation of, of money, and they extract things, and there's no way to see how much gold they're extracting. So we had to, we used, we contact the EITI, which is an international transparent extracting industries, and they work with us a lot. Now, money laundering is do the banks. Those are just the banks. Nobody can do money laundering by the banks. So we had to regulate more the banks. We closed two or three banks. Right now we're getting ready to close two banks in Guatemala. One of the two largest banks in Guatemala, the presidents are both in jail and in trouble for doing money laundering. So things are working well. We have contraband. Then I uh, found out there was a lot of agencies in the world that could help us to do that. So I had advice from them, and they helped me out to develop rules and regulations. I went to Congress, and we did a Board of Security and Justice. We did a law against corruption and illicit enrichment. That's what I was telling you before. It was not illegal to receive bribes. It was bad. It was unethical. But it was, no, was not penalized by law. So we created this law. The senators didn't see the impact of what was going on, but this came in that the result we have more than 100 people in jail right now. And then the law in banking. Then GFI, Global Financial Integrity, uh, suggests to put this law, which in Colombia, in Mexico, they're using it, uh, which is a law that allows you to see your accounts without processing you if you have uh, your assets are related to your salaries. If you have a $10 million home, but you make $100,000 a year, it doesn't make any sense. So if you cannot show me how do you buy your stuff, immediately the government takes that property and becomes property of the government, and the government can sell it, and it's an automatic thing. Then we, we didn't send it back, and we have a two-month two period of time to show that it's yours. But if you don't show it's yours, then the government will take it. That law was done for, for narco-trafficking. But we found a lot of people in government were connected to narco-trafficking and had this. So right now the president and the vice president of Guatemala are in jail because they have access of $160, $200 million and their salary was $100,000 a year. So it was impossible to have all those things. So it was a good thing. And then the PEP project, which is all the politically exposed people, all the people in government, their accounts are checked daily. If I put $100,000 in my account, tomorrow they send me a note and say, where do you get that money from? And that last 20 years where everybody has been in government. So they have pretty good control. So this is the political part that I learned a lot. That's why I'm telling you this. It may get sometimes a little boring, but it's important because it shows you what can happen in the future. Then going back into medicine, when I left office, then I came back to the medical unit. Unicar is the cardiovascular unit in Guatemala. Is the only place where heart surgery is done in Guatemala. We have, remember, we have 17 million people. And this is a very small unit for the whole country, but it's the only place that has the budget and the facilities to do it. We started this in the, in the 90s. Uh, in 1994, we started working that. Of course, Nunez helped me a lot in the formation of this. And we started with, uh, the idea was to provide heart services to poor people. The rich guys came here to Houston went to Miami, went to Cleveland Clinic. 
But mainly they came to Houston because we used to do a lot of Guatemalans. Dr. Winter, remember, taking care of a lot of Guatemalan patients. But those are the guys that can pay for it. But 80% of them couldn't come to Houston. So we decided to do something for them. So we had two cardiac rooms, six ICU beds, 25 beds, and one cardiac cath lab. This is the initial one. But then we start growing a lot. And in 2004, I operated on the father of the president of the country. So I said, listen, I need to grow. And sort of I push him into giving us money. So they gave us money to set up a new building. And the new building had five four hours, 25 ICU beds, 75 regular beds, and three cardiac cath labs. And that's what we currently have. I'm hoping the current president gets sick so I can get more money out of him and, and, and get a new building. So either him or his family, he's pretty young, so either him or his family, I hope they can get something where they can help us to build some, some stuff. But this is the cardiovascular unit. This is the adult staff. Uh, uh, these two, I have, I already started the heart surgery program too, which I needed to train people because no one can come to the States to study. So I started being in the university. We started the heart unit. Actually, this lady will be the first heart surgeon in Central America, a female heart surgeon. Uh, this other guy also is getting trained. These are general surgery residents. This is a perfusionist. All my anesthesia staff are females. Joe is good to have females in anesthesia. They're all females in anesthesia. They're great. They're great anesthesiologists. These two ladies are the best, and this lady, they're all women. And these are the guys of the surgeons in here. This is, he is currently the Minister of Health. He was a, he's a perfusionist, and he's a surgeon. And this is, this is the team in the adult part. Uh, Dr. Bonilla trained here with us in Houston in the 80s. Well, I don't know if you remember or not. He trained in Mexico, and then he came here. He's back in Guatemala operating. This is the pediatric staff. We were lucky enough that Dr. Aldo Castaneda, he was the chief of pediatrics at Boston Children's for a long time. He's from Guatemala originally. He did the same thing I did. He came back to Guatemala. Uh, he's about 10 years older than me, but he's one of the innovators and one of the best pediatric heart surgeons of the 20th century. He did a lot of the neonatology surgery, in utero surgery. Uh, he was he's a fantastic uh, pediatric heart surgeon. We're <clears throat> lucky enough to, to have him down there. Actually, we are the only case we did together. I took this picture because we never operated together. But this case, he asked me to help him because there was an aortic arch, an aortic arch in a 10-year-old that came from San Salvador. He had a big aneurysm of an aortic arch, and uh, he didn't do too much art surgery. So since I was in Houston, he said, why don't we help me out? We did on the profound hypothermia. We didn't have stents or anything. So we just changed the arch, and the, the girl did okay. So it was, it was good to see. This is our cardiac cath lab. Uh, we actually can't do anything. I'm sorry that this is in Spanish. I didn't translate it, but we do everything really in, in cardiology and interventional cardiology. We really can do everything. And uh, our cardiologists are very gifted, very good, and we do almost everything um, that, uh, that you can do here. We don't have all the facilities you have, but with the equipment we have, we practically do everything. In surgery, we do everything except transplantation. We don't have the program of transplantation set up yet, but we do any invasive cardiac surgery that we can do. We've done extending aortic aneurysms. We do mainly valves and coronaries, which is our everyday thing. So we do a, a lot of valves. We still have a lot of valve pathology, not just rheumatic fever, but also we have degenerative uh, uh, aortic disease. I was amazed to see I've done uh, almost 80 ascending aortic aneurysms. And half of them are Marfans, which I didn't know how many Marfans in Guatemala, but we did have. And it was, I mean, you could recognize it because we have all these Mayans that were tiny little bitty guys. Suddenly it was a big, tall girl, and she, it was the, she was the Marfan, and I knew that they were having this in the aortic So we've done a lot of this, and also in the army we picked up a lot of dilated aortas. So uh, we've done a lot of this, uh, of these cases. Uh, we also, we have a lot of tumors, a lot of myxomas, which when we compare with the world literature, we have a lot of population with myxomas of the heart. Uh, we're trying to do a genetic, uh, genetic study to see why that area has so many myxomas and, and heart problems. So uh, our statistics go with most of what's happening in the world. Our uh, mortality rate is in between 5 to 7%. We do about 500 cases a year. Uh, in adult and 500 kids, and 
this is our ICU unit. Uh, we're not as fancy. We still have bottles because we found the bottles were cheaper than the plastic, uh, than the plastic uh, chest tubes. So we still have those bottles because they can rewash them and redo them, and, and we had to save money everywhere. So we find out, at the beginning, I was very upset. I was trying to get those plastics. But then they showed me that financially, it was cheaper just to wash those, those bottles. And, and they work as good as the plastics. And they don't break. They are very tough. They don't break too much. One thing that we had and we created was an ecosystem all over the country. We put echoes in all the uh, health uh, centers in, in the country. And they, they translate and project into a center in Guatemala. So we diagnose in Guatemala a lot of tumors, bowel disease, and heart dysfunctions. And then if you have something abnormal, we call them and we tell them to send them to Guatemala. So we see them in Guatemala. And the idea in the future is to put a unicar cardiac system in different parts of the country. My next step in the next 10 years is to build up two more cardiac units, one in the west part and one in the east part of Guatemala. This is the west part, it's Quetzaltenango, and the eastern, uh, we have San Salvador and Honduras in here close. So we're trying to build up these areas in here. Jose knows the hospital system very well in Guatemala, and uh, he's going to help me into building up all these projects that we had in in mind. Also, we have associate, uh, foundations. I have one foundation, Dr. Castaneda Foundation, and we raise funds every year. We do uh, all kind of cultural events, sporting events, to get some money and help what the government cannot give us. So we try to stay very active. Uh, the administrators, they had to work with us, and we have very excellent administrators that help us and they try to save money, we try to spend money. So we, it's a fight of why we, we, we want to have everything and they said, no, we just have to regulate. But we had a great relationship with them and they have, our budget runs about uh, $10 million a year. Five from the government and five that we have from the social security system. So our whole budget for the whole United Nation is about $10 million a year, which is very few. I wish we could have $100 million a year. But that's, that's my aim. But I'm trying to be there. We have a lot of outpatient systems. Uh, the outpatient stays very busy. This is the outpatient clinic. And we have a very, very good electrophysiology lab. Uh, we have state-of-the-art uh, uh, equipment. There was a family that has some problems with a, with a patient, with a, with a little girl that has some uh, electrophysiological problems. So they donate us the whole equipment. I have the, the, state of the, the best equipment in electrophysiology. And we're the only ones in, in Central America. So we receive a lot of patients in electrophysiology, uh, in, mainly in pediatrics. We do a lot. I was amazed to see how many pediatric problems we have. This is our cardiac cat labs. This is one of our cardiologists. He trained in Mexico. This is our uh, staff and technical people. We have uh, uh, three, now we're only about four cardiac cat lab. Um, where we have a lot of actions. In surgery, like we said, last year we were a little lower than 2013 and 15. In 2014, we have some money problems. The government didn't pay us the last quarter. So we were pretty sure that we had to cut down to, in the last three months, to half of the case. So we depend a lot on what the government wants us to do. Uh, briefly, that's the, our, in adults, most of the surgery is open. In PDS, we do a lot of and non-invasive and closed surgeries. And uh, we're closing all the ductus. We don't operate ductus anymore. We all just uh, close them with a little device. ASDs, VSDs, we close them all with devices. We do a lot of the quartations. Right now they're all dilated and they put stents. So we have done a quartation in the last five years because they're all done by stents and they have good results. And this is the surgical team. This is the, we have the, a very good relation therapy equipment and people. But what really makes the difference is people. These people take their job very seriously and they work very hard. They study very hard with the limitations they have. Nutrition is very important to us because most of the patients, mainly the pediatrics, they're all malnourished. Mainly the poor people, they are horrible malnourishment. And they, of course, push into infections and all kinds of things that we see. Infection, we have a, uh, an infection control that is very, very tight. Uh, we, uh, in this, this is our infection rate in adults. We had, uh, out of the almost 390 patients that were operated last year, 
38 were infected, 32 were superficial, and six deep infections, which I think was very clean. Actually, and this year we've been doing very well. But we have the nurses in there are very tough. In there they keep you, they watch you, see if you're washing your hands, if your shoes are clean, if you brush your teeth. I mean, they really go, they are after you all the time. And nurses, they like, should be, have a lot of responsibility. To me, nurses are the ones that really know how to run a hospital, more than physicians, because they really know the whole spectrum. Uh, I respect them a lot. Now we've been very, uh, very protective of nurses because I think they are the soul of a health institution because they, they have a more, actually I said the Ministry of Health should be a nurse because they're the one that really know the whole spectrum of the medical science. Uh, the infections are mainly, I don't know if you saw here, the, the, we, we try to culture everything we can, and the bugs that we see more often are Klebsiella, mainly in children, have pneumonias, uh, then pseudomona, and then uh, staph. So that's the, the things that we see most of the time. Uh, we do have a, a nosocomial control that are very close. This is an infected a mitral valve that I did a couple of weeks ago. It's a young lady that came with acute uh, heart failure, uh, wide open mitral valve, uh, my echo, and this is the valve. This is the anterior leaflet. That was all destroyed. The posterior was almost gone. The anterior was hanging out like, a, like just a, a flap in there. And this is the anterior leaflet. Had a, this huge hole was the anterior leaflet. There's a hole in the leaflet where I see it the infection. Uh, uh, she had uh, pseudomonas growing in here, um, and staff. There was a mixture of things. It was a young soccer player that had uh, a acute aortic insufficiency with a, a, an aortic valve that was infected. Also, you see the vegetations here in the in the uh, uh, anterior leaflet. Uh, what, we see a lot of pathology in the valves. And one thing that I saw from Dr. Crawford, since we have these big annulus. I saw Dr. Crawford designed to do a trans-aortic mitral valve replacement. In his book, there's a couple of uh, pictures, which actually I was talking to Joe Caselli, and he said that he had not that many. But I've done already nine of this. I had a huge aortic ring, so through the aortic valve you can do the mitral. Actually, it gets very easy to do. You just pull the valve, cut it off, and the other thing you have to be careful is that you put the valve upside down. Because if you put it the way it comes set up, you put it backwards. So you have to turn it upside down. You have to remember when you put it and put it in there. But this is a mitral valve that we that we put in. As you see, actually here, you can see the mitral is already set in there, and we're putting the aortic valve. We do have a lot of dilated annulus, and it really is a nice operation because you use one incision, and the patients do do pretty well. Uh, this is a rupture uh, uh, septum. After my call in Parson, there was a 55-year-old lady who came with this big, huge hole in acute failure. This is the right ventricle. This is the left ventricle in here. We just put, like we used, like we always do, put some patches around and then put a Dacron patch in here. And uh, we do have a lot of these uh, patients coming up. And then we join the medical school. Uh, it's important in an institution like this to have an academic affiliation. I was lucky enough to go and work with the university, Mariano Galvez. It's a private university, the largest private university in Guatemala. The largest is this, the national university. But in private schools, this is the largest university. We have 80,000 students all over the country. The medical school has 1,200 students. I'm in charge of medical science. So I have nursing, physiotherapy, nutrition, uh, medicine, uh, dental school, uh, the public health, criminology, and psychology. So it's, we are actually, uh, the vice director is here with me, uh, he's sitting in here, he's an engineer, he's the vice, vice director of uh, research, and his father runs the presidency of the university. And we're trying to build up a health city where all the medical science are concentrated and dedicated to the change of medical systems. They're very innovative, and this is an institute of mathematics, this is right across my office. I, I, this is the view I have from the mathematics institute. This is the, as close as I get to mathematics is being right in front of the school. He's still out of my league. He is the one that uh, runs this, this mathematics lab, and it's a beautiful setup. Uh, this is our classrooms and labs, and we're trying to do a very interactive uh, 
and system. We don't, we try not to use systems like this where people are sitting around, but we use in tables and chairs where students can move around, can mobilize, and they become more active and they're more participatory. Also, we're doing a study on what we call flip education. We ask the teachers to give a talk in, in a video and send the students the video. They see the class and then in classroom, we discuss what they saw in the video. Now they have phones and they have videos, they have tablets, they go to the cafeteria, they can watch the lecture in there and we talk about the lecture later on. This is a project that we have uh, with Google and it's called Flip Education. And it's working pretty well because students get more are participants and they understand more the situation that we have. This is a very interesting building. It's called the Seismology Lab. The whole building is a big platform. It's about from there to the wall. It's a big platform when they shake up and they mimic uh, an earthquake. And they, they put materials, they do construction, they test different uh, projects uh, against earthquakes. We are an earthquake air, uh, area in the world. We have people from Japan, from Mexico, from the Middle East, doing studies and working out on materials to, to maintain the, the, this institute. Of course, soccer has to be there. Interesting, this soccer stadium, underneath there's a building. There's a four-story building with cl classrooms. And that's why it's very interesting because the roof, they use it as a soccer uh, field. So the students, they go to class and then they play soccer rather than the terrace. So it's, it's a very nice setup. And this is the, the system we try to use. Instead of having uh, all horizontally all the, the desks, we're trying to move them around. Actually, you see the, the chairs have wheels, so they can be moving around and they can be more interactive. This is the, all the uh, uh, electronic systems for medical records, for uh, uh, electronic information, and uh, the systems of the university. These are, again, we try to do small classes, too. We have no, no more than 30 students per class. And they have a very nice environment, air conditioning, and uh, really we make it pleasant to the student to be there and work very actively. This is our main auditorium. These are administrative buildings. Of course, we push sports, uh, trying to put some racquetball courts, because I used to play a lot of racquetball. I, I need to come back to play racquetball, so I get to be 90 like Dr. Winters. Uh, this is a uh, different places that we had all over the country in World with is in the northwest part of the country. This is the west part of, of the country. This is another setup that we had in different parts of the of Guatemala. This is the medical staff and the medical school and health sciences that we run. This is the activities that I have to do in the afternoon. Uh, uh, keeps me working. These are, uh, uh, are people that really work very hard. And we have students from all over the world, actually. This guy is from Belize, and this guy is from San Salvador. So we have students from all Central America that come and be with us. We have some classrooms that are a little more fresh, and uh, our future is moving to what do we need to do. That's the reason I came this morning to see the simulation lab. We're trying to set up a simulation lab, and it's not because we want to do it. It's a thing that will be done. Human rights is getting very, very close to medical schools. They say, how come a pilot before gets to fly an airplane or gets a 747, they had to do simulation. They had to pass over 90 all the simulation tests. Why doctors go to the hospital and they don't get simulation training? They train with the patients. And that's what we train. We learn with the patients. We do try and error, try and error. And the victims are the patients. Really, that's what happened. And human rights is watching that. It's getting very strong. So simulation labs will be uh, mandatory in all the medical schools in order to to the student to go to the hospital, they had to pass the simulation test. They had to learn how to put IVs, put subclavians, intubate patients, do CPR, do really be prepared. When they go to see a patient, they know what to do. Had to put a Foley. It's amazing. People don't teach you how to put a Foley. You just see somebody and you by logic put a little catheter, but nobody tells you how to inflate, do this thing. Nobody tells you that. You're learning from common sense which sometimes carries a lot of problems. So we're trying to work with the simulation lab, and uh, we're going to see your, uh, your simulation systems here. We're trying to get these simulation babies and simulation adults. We do deliveries. I mean, before you deliver in a patient, you had to, to pass the simulation in a, in a robot, because yeah, really, they are so real that it's scary when you walk in there. 
And then the brothers talk back to you, say good morning, and say good morning to you. Because if you feel like you're Frankenstein and you're working on a thing, we, we teach you how to scrub, uh, how to, this is our vice rector, take care of the baby. He, he, he came with me and started looking at this baby. These are the, 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 the babies that we, that we see. And this is the training. Uh, here you can do CPR, you can listen to heart sounds, breath sounds. These are, I mean, this chest is just like a human chest. You really can, uh, you, you can mimic every disease in the lungs. And you can hear it and you can prepare your students and then you test them. And they had to score over 90 uh, in these systems. They, they set up in here and they had to, they show them all the mistakes they make. So they go back again. If they make mistakes, they see back and forth what they do. Well, that's what we're trying to do, and that's what we're trying to inspire the new generations. Uh, our project is to build four hospitals in Guatemala, university hospitals. Uh, my project, this will be in the east part of Guatemala, which is an area very hot like Houston. That's the reason we have this set up. Uh, we hope to do this in Guatemala City, this in Guatanango, and probably this in Quetzaltenango. So those are the, the views that we have in order to make this health science grow, and really be a center where we can train people in Central America. But the main thing is to interact with institutions like this. Uh, be part of this institution, participate with you all, and learn from your experiences like I did. Spending all my life you hear a lot, a lot from people from this medical center, and that's our view. To learn from you, to work with you, and to have a much better world. And believe me, the world is great. The world is advancing a lot. All the bad things are just little tiny things. I think 90% of the things happening in the world are good. Just 10% are bad. The thing is that the press always gives you 90% of the bad things and they forget about the good things. But the world is great and uh, the most important thing is to have this friendship, this interaction with people like you that can give us better ideas, you are smarter than we are, but that's what will make us be much better people. So thank you very much, I'm sorry. I took so much time.